and welcome to my living room. Uh, I mean, my working area. Um, I'm Adam Yarrow, and I'm an aerospace engineer at BA Systems Australia. So, I'm originally from Brisbane, and I studied at the University of Queensland between 2014 and 2017, doing a mechanical and aerospace engineering degree. So, when I graduated in 2018, I got a job with BA Systems in Melbourne, and moved down there to do their graduate program. Since then, I've now spent a year as an aerospace engineer in their research and development department, based in Richmond. So why does BAE invest in research and development? I guess I thought I would answer this by going into a bit of the history of BAE and its prior companies within Australia and seeing how that research and development has impacted our future work. So I guess the atypical example or the typical example is the development of NOLCA. So NOLCA started out as a concept at DSTO and through some industry partnerships and some research and development turned into what we see today, which is a hovering rocket EW seduction mechanism for stealing away anti-ship missiles from your ship. Now this product that we see today was the brainchild of some very low TRL technology that was grown through research and development into a, something that we can now use as a capability and sell to not only the Australian Defence Force, but also the global market. So I guess in a more recent time scale, BAE Systems in the early 2000s to 2015 was investing in autonomous capability. So we did a lot of concept demonstrators for both air and land vehicles, and based on that capability, we then secured work with the Loyal Wingman program doing some of the autonomous systems for that. And this continues to be an area which we're leveraging and growing within our research and development team. For example, with the M113 project. So another key area which BAE has recently been investing into in the past was the area of hypersonics. So BAE was involved with the HiFi program we did some of the autopilots for the flight vehicles, as well as some test equipment to help ensure that the vehicles will perform as expected. So for those who aren't aware, the HiFi program was an international collaboration between DSTO, AFRL, and a few industries and university partners. Ultimately, this program was doing some fundamental research into the hypersonic flight regime which now has given us an internal capability to work with hypersonic systems. And given the current Defence Force structures planned for 2020, highlighting the importance of hypersonic capability, this leverages our existing experience and puts it in a good place for future work. I guess the third and final area that BAE has some ex extensive history and pedigree within is ISR EW systems. So within Adelaide, we have a lot of EW capability and through previous research and development that led us to develop systems that enable us to support existing programs. So this is another area of interest for research and development within BAE today. So given all of that context and that history behind what previous research and development we've done, I guess why we do research and development boils down to two key factors. The first of which is we're a technology company. So ultimately, we want to be competitive when we go for bids, when we deliver our current work and our current commitments. So having some kind of technological edge or IP or capability within our company is core in ensuring that we win this work over our competitors. So that's why BAE's R&D team is focused on taking technology which is low TRL from you know, research labs, universities, startups, and maturing it to a level where we can inject it into our delivery business to improve efficiency or give us that capability edge for when we go to bid for future acquisition programs. So I guess the second factor as to why we do R&D comes down to the fact that we're a defense company. So not only do we develop technology, but we develop technology for the defense force, in particular the ADF primarily. So it's our responsibility to help the ADF have the capability that they need to deliver their jobs successfully when they're deployed, whether it's into a battlefield, whether it's disaster relief, it doesn't matter. Our job is to provide the ADF with the cutting edge capability so that they have the best chance for success. So I guess 
That combined with our needs as a technology company is why we're driving towards doing research and development more and more. So what exactly is my job? As I said, I'm an aerospace engineer and I work in a small team of about six people who are aerospace engineers, modeling and simulation engineers and guidance and control engineers. The majority of my work at the moment is the modeling and simulation of flight vehicles. So this involves everything from dynamics to aerodynamics, modeling actuation systems, modeling sensors such as GPSs, IMUs, as well as helping implement autopilots and developing autopilots that the rest of the team have worked on. So I spend about 90% of my time developing these tools and models within C++. And the other 10% is split, I guess, between MATLAB and Python, with mainly MATLAB used for sort of data analysis, input, output. Now, relative to university, I studied as a mechanical and aerospace engineer. So my coding skills were roughly sort of Python levels. Um, but as part of my role now, I've learnt C++ on the job and implement it now on a day-to-day -day basis. I guess in terms of other skills that I've used from university, because of the work I'm doing at the moment is around flight vehicles, a lot of my aerodynamics work, so stability analysis, sort of understanding roughly how aircraft work and what you should expect in certain scenarios. On top of this, uh, a lot of my numerics studies from university have become quite important because obviously all of our simulation tools are in a numerical environment. So it's not so much writing your own, say, RK4 solver from scratch, but it's more being able to take a library of solvers and apply an appropriate one based on the different scenarios you have. Sort of this justifying of assumptions and understanding the core mechanics behind what you're doing, as opposed to implementing it in first principles. Otherwise, I spend a little bit of time doing documentation, which is nice relative to a sustainment or production project. R&D typically has lower documentation requirements, but it's still there. And on top of that, there's also still testing requirements. So unit testing of code, verifying your results makes sense and ensuring that your product meets the requirements of your customer. So, how did I end up in the research and development field? It's a bit of a long story, but I'll keep it short for time's sake. Essentially, I started as a graduate with BAE in 2018, and as part of the graduate program, we have six-month rotations and some graduate modules where you meet up with other graduates from across the country and do some soft skills development. So at those graduate modules, I met Ed Mathia, who was the current Aerospace Futures chairperson for that year. Now, Ed convinced BAE HR to send along some professional engineers and some graduates to the conference that year, which I was fortunate enough to attend. And while I was there, I was talking with some of the professional engineers, and I met one guy called Andy. And as it turns out, Andy had worked on the High Flyer program with BAE, developing some of the autopilots for it. Now, me being me and loving high mark numbers, coming from the University of Queensland, where everything is scramjets and hypersonics, I was, like, blown my mind. I was a kid in a candy shop. So after talking with Andy, we sort of went back, and then for the next 12 months, I kind of pestered him every now and then, asking if there was any work. And then it came to my final graduate rotation, and at the same time, BAE was standing up our research and development team. And a project came along that aligned with my skill set Andy was running, and because we'd networked, we connected, and Andy knew that I was passionate about what I was doing, it meant that I got put on for my final graduate placement with him. And then at the end of the six months, I rolled off the graduate program and into a full-time aerospace engineering role. So here I am. So based on my progression into the research and development team at BA Systems Australia, if I had to give one piece of advice to others on how to get into this field or how to pursue a career in this area, I think it would be to always keep learning and to be willing to learn new things and to be very adaptable in how you operate. So as I mentioned, I'm a mechanical engineer and at university I didn't really know any coding. And now in my role is pretty much 100% developing in C++. 
So that kind of transition from knowing Python to developing in C++ has happened over a period of six months, a year tops. So being willing to learn this off your own back outside of work and then being able to put your hand up and say, hey, I'll give this a shot if you give me a chance. If you say that, a lot of people are willing to give you the chance and are willing to invest their time in you to develop new things. So being able to have a broad skill set that you can apply to a multitude of different scenarios is really important for the research and development environment because typically you're quite budget and resource constrained. So if you're the jack of all trades who knows a little bit about enough, a little bit about everything or enough to be dangerous, but also knows the kind of people who are the experts in the field that they can draw back upon when you get up to areas which you don't understand. So combining that sort of eagerness to learn with knowing who you can rely on to help you get to where you need to be would be a great asset if you want to go into a research and development career. Or at least I think that's how it's worked out for me. I guess the technology I'm most excited to see develop in the future is the commercialization of hypersonic flight. So I'm a massive fan of high mark numbers. I love everything that's working on the bleeding edge of what's possible. So hypersonic flight, especially commercialized hypersonic flight, for me is a really important thing that I'd love to see happen in the near future because no one likes a 15 hour flight to the US. So being able to do it in three or five would be an amazing thing, especially if it was cheap. Obviously, there's a lot of technological challenges around thermal management, material selection, engine development, but I'm hoping that in the future years, they'll start to have breakthroughs in those areas, which will be really exciting to see. Um, I guess the second thing for me is the development of quantum technologies, probably in a more general sense. I won't pretend in any way that I understand quantum technologies, but from what I've seen, what I've read about sort of quantum encryption or quantum radar, they all seem very promising and very interesting areas that could explode within the next couple of years. Of particular interest to me, I guess, would be quantum radar and potentially quantum clocks. With quantum clocks, you can you have highly accurate sort of timing systems, which means highly accurate INS systems, which are great in GPS denied environments. And on top of that, quantum radar, I remember going to a Bert Rutan lecture and he said everything was stealth before radar. So I feel like there is the potential for quantum radar to be the next thing that sort of levels the playing field in terms of stealth technology, which is a really exciting and scary place to be in the near future. I guess in terms of any final advice I would give to my past self, I guess there's three things I'd probably say. The first of which would be to enjoy university more and to get out and do things that weren't just my degree. I didn't really join any clubs. I didn't get to experience the university lifestyle as I would have liked when I did it. I had good grades, which helped me get my job. But at the same time, I felt like I missed out on that hands-on experience that you get from joining or doing things such as AYAA or Formula SAE. Things that inherently, unfortunately, cost a lot of money to do by yourself once you start working. The second thing would be to get a graduate job that allows you to rotate around in the first two years. So I was fortunate that BAE Systems Graduate Program does this, and I'm a great advocate for it. Because when I left university, I was fairly certain that I wanted to do a specific thing. But as it turns out, when I went to work, doing that thing was not how I enjoyed it at university. So being able to move around not only exposed me to the broader business and gave me a lot better understanding and lots of networks and connections, it also helped me refine what I actually enjoyed doing and helped me end up in my role that I am now, which I really love and I'm so glad I ended up there rather than just sort of going straight down into a very niche field immediately. I guess the third and final thing would be to get a hobby outside of engineering. So I didn't realize this in a while until quite recently, but having a hobby outside of engineering is good for de-stressing, having something to talk about at the pub with your non-engineering mates. So overall, it's just a great thing to have that unfortunately I didn't learn until COVID has hit and I've realized that I've 
work far too much. But apart from those three things, I think it went pretty well.